We are going to take a break from finite difference time domain and talk about some electromagnetic theory that we are going to need in order to calculate reflection and transmission from a device. There's an easy way and a hard way to do this. So I'm gonna show you the hard way. The reason I wanna show you the hard way, I'll also show you the easy way, but the hard way, there's more information in it that is incredibly valuable sometimes. And I will show you examples of when that is valuable toward the end of the semester. But what we're gonna do, a, we're gonna be modeling a periodic structure like a grating. A wave hits the grating, the grating chops up that wave front, and in fact diffracts that into waves traveling in discrete directions, in a bunch of different directions. What we will do is calculate how much power, or what fraction of power from that original applied wave ends up in each of those diffracted modes. And then we can add all of those up to calculate overall reflectance and transmittance. And there's a lot of meaning in how much energy is in each of those, and that can be used to do some really neat things. So the discussion of that is divided between this lecture and the next lecture. This lecture focuses really on the electromagnetic theory. Then the next lecture, we put a little bit more electromagnetic theory on it and then reduce that to practice in our finite difference time domain code. We will briefly review what we did last time and then start in this lecture. I want to start off talking about wave vectors. And it turns out there's more to this story than you've probably heard before. A wave vector is the vector that points in the direction the wave is traveling, and its magnitude is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. However, they can also be complex numbers, and I want to illustrate what that means so we can get physical meaning out of that. Next, I want to talk about something called phase matching at an interface. And it turns out Snell's law normally is what describes refraction. However, it is not the most general way of doing things. There are times where Snell's law cannot be applied at an interface. And the more general framework, the more rigorous framework is something called phase matching. Once we're done that, we can talk about what happens at an interface when a wave hits an interface. And that interface can be air to a diffraction grating or air to or anything to anything. So what happens there? In order to discuss that, we also need to talk about waves and periodic media because some strange and interesting and useful things happen. And we'll end up having something called the plane wave spectrum. And essentially a wave traveling through something that's periodic, like a grating, it chops up the wave front, and suddenly our wave front is periodic. Anything that's periodic can be decomposed into a Fourier series. Now suddenly our wave is composed of discrete components described by the Fourier series. And it turns out each one of those terms in a Fourier series is a plane wave. So a periodic structure chops up an incoming wave into a bunch of discrete plane waves traveling in different directions. And it's a discrete thing. It's not a continuum. And that'll end this lecture. So last time we talked about, given the PML and a two-dimensional grid, how to lay out the grid. And by the end of next lecture, you'll know much more of why we have to add the spacer region between the device and the PML. But suffice to say, we want to put about a wavelength between the device and your PML. And if you're calculating reflection and transmission over a broad range of frequencies or wavelengths, you would go with the longest wavelength or the wavelength associated with the lowest frequency. But we'll make our PMLs maybe 20 cells. We'll put them about a wavelength from our device. We'll put our total field scatter field interface, not overlapping our device, not inside the PML, but in the problem space, just a couple cells away from the PML. To inject a one-way source, we're using something called the total field scattered field framework. And we define part of our grid to be scattered field quantities and the other part of the grid total field quantities. The total field contains the source and the field scattered from our device. The scattered field region contains only the field scattered from the device. So in that sense, we're really launching a one-way source. We don't see the source up in the scattered field region. Now what happens, we have finite difference equations at the interface. So we'll have finite difference equations in the scattered field region that reaches across to the total field region and contains terms from the total field. Those don't look like scattered field quantities. We have to correct them. 
Likewise, we have finite difference equations in the total field containing scattered field quantities, and we have to fix that to make those look like total field quantities. When we fix all those finite difference equations at the interface, suddenly we see a one-way source entering our model. The terms that reach across the interface are the terms containing the spatial derivatives, the x, y, z's, and we've pulled those into our curl operations. So it turns out after we calculate curl across the grid, we then work across the grid right at the interface and add these little correction terms to those curl computations. Then the source really is the same as for the one-dimensional finite difference time domain. We set the electric field source on the total field side to just a, a Gaussian impulse. The H field source on the scattered field side is essentially the same thing. It has a different amplitude because of the impedance of the material. It's delayed because it's a half cell away from the electric field. It's also delayed because it's a half time step away from the electric field. So we have to incorporate all that so we have an H field source component that's compatible with the E field source. And we ended up modifying the block diagram of our main loop. And essentially this only change, we calculated the curl, the only change is after we calculate the curl, after we fill in the grid and we're done that, we have another loop that works horizontally across the grid that incorporates those correction terms at the total field scatter field interface. And we have two places where we're calculating curl. In the update for the H fields, we calculate the curl of the E field. And then in the update for the D field, we're calculating the curl of the H field. But immediately following those curl computations, we set up a loop to go across the grid and insert those correction terms. And then we have our one-way source. And a very similar thing for the H mode. Okay. On to this lecture, and our first topic is wave vectors. We need to get a much deeper understanding of what a wave vector is and what happens when it's a complex number. So first, what is a wave vector? Well, it points in the direction of a wave. What I'm showing here is a wave traveling in, the, in this direction, in the direction of K. These little square regions fuzzed out, if you will. That's a plane of equal phase. And so we can kind of see our wave trucking along. It's as if we froze time here. And so K points normal to these interfaces in the direction the wave is traveling. And if we look at the spacing between those planes of equal phase, we can get the wavelength of our wave. So K not only points in the direction of the wave, but its magnitude is 2 pi divided by the period of the wave. Well, if we know the wave's frequency, then we know the wave's free space wavelength. We can then write the magnitude of K instead of being 2 pi over the wavelength, where wavelength can change depending what material it's in. We can write it as 2 pi divided by the free space wavelength. That never changes times refractive index. And in fact, a lot of times when I look at the wave vector K, I really think of its magnitude as conveying the refractive index. It's not exactly refractive index, it's the refractive index times 2 pi over the free space wavelength, but I tend to think that way. Now the utility of this wave vector is that we can express an electric field this way. We can have some amplitude, and then we can just say complex exponential of k dot r, where k is this wave vector, r is a vector of position. So the ability to do this is the benefit of having this wave vector. So remember, the wave vector carries two pieces of information. The direction is the direction of the wave, and the magnitude conveys the period of the wave, or we can also think of the magnitude conveying refractive index. Now, the wave vector can be complex. Let's look at a little one-dimensional uh, version of this for simplicity. So here we're, we're looking at a wave traveling in the z direction, e to the j, k, z, where k is our wave number or just the magnitude of our wave vector. Let's let it be complex. So our k will be some real part plus some imaginary part. So what we'll do is we'll take this expression for k and just plug it in to the exponential up here. And when we do that, we get the product of two different exponentials. We can separate the alpha and beta terms here. And what we see is that the alpha comes out 
this J associated with the alpha cancels with this J up here. We just get an E to the minus alpha Z. So we recognize that as a pure decay term. So the alpha is the attenuation coefficient, and it's responsible for the decay due to loss in the material. Then we have an E to the J beta Z. That's a complex exponential. This is an oscillation. So this is our wave, if you will, E to the J beta Z. So beta is our propagation constant. It describes the accumulation of phase as a function of distance. And the magnitude of it is 2 pi over wavelength and 2 pi over n. This is really the discussion we had on the previous slide with the magnitude of k. However, once k becomes, magnitude, or becomes complex, it's a little bit more difficult to interpret what we did on the previous slide. So it turns out it's the real part of k that follows this rule, and the imaginary part is the decay. Now let's show some pictures of what this actually looks like when k becomes complex. When it's purely real, so this is the wave vector that you learn in Electromagnetics 101. When it's purely real, we're talking about a pure oscillation. So it looks like a cosine, constant amplitude, trucking along in a single direction. If k is purely imaginary, so in other words that beta term is zero but alpha is something that's non-zero, we're talking about pure decay, an exponential decay. And the direction of that k is, or the, the direction of the dk is in the direction of the k vector, just like over here. Now, if k is complex, it has both a real and an imaginary part, it's doing both of these. It's oscillating and decaying at the same time. Now, in reality, k really should always be complex because all materials have some loss, maybe really, really small, but all materials have some real loss. K will be complex due to that, and usually we see that. And there's times that K can become, become complex, and we'll see that here. It'll become complex without having loss in the materials. There's other mechanisms that can produce that. Now, that was just with a standard scalar K. What if K really is a vector? In this case, let's restrict it to the XY plane. And the x component and the y component, both of those could be real or imaginary or complex. And well, let's see what happens. So if both components of k, of a vector k, are real, we have pure oscillation in both the x and y directions. So and when we propagate in x and y, what that really means is we're propagating down the diagonal. So we see just a pure cosine coming down the diagonal. Let's say the y component is real, that means in the y direction we see constant amplitude oscillations, but the x component is purely imaginary. There's no wiggles in the x direction, it is pure decay. So really in this case we're talking about a wave that's pushing power in the y direction. When it decays it does not push power along. All right, what if we have a real ky so we have oscillations in the y direction with no decay, but the x component is complex. We actually do have oscillations now, but also decay. So in this case, we're talking about a wave traveling down the diagonal. However, it's decaying in the x direction. Well, now let's move over to the case where we have an, an imaginary ky. So in the y direction, we have pure decay, no oscillations. But here we also have a real x component. That means we have oscillations without decay in the x direction. And so it's pushing power in this case in the x direction. Now if both the x component and y component of k, if they're both imaginary, we have pure decay in the direction right down the middle between the x and y axes. Anyway, I don't need to step through all these. You, you get the pattern here. We have k which can be a vector, each component now of that vector can be real, imaginary, or complex. And this also extends to three dimensions, albeit harder to visualize. Given that, we can start talking about phase matching at an interface, which is really a generalization to Snell's law or talking about uh, refraction. So we have something called the dispersion relation. 
We know that the solution to the wave equation is plane waves. We can plug that solution back into Maxwell's equations, turn the crank, and out comes a restriction on what our k vector can be depending what direction it is in. And so for ordinary materials, this dispersion relation looks like this. And it's essentially Pythagorean theorem. What we see is kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. This is the magnitude of the k vector equals the free space wave number, that's 2 pi over the free space wavelength times refractive index squared. What this is really saying, if we're interpreting the wave vector as refractive index, no matter what direction a wave tries to go in this material, it sees the same refractive index in any direction. And so if we map that refractive index as a function of direction, it forms a sphere. And so you'll recognize this as the equation for a sphere. So while I've just described the radius, if you will, of this index ellipsoid or the sphere as refractive index, strictly speaking, it's the magnitude of the k vector. I'm just thinking quickly and calling it refractive index because I know the magnitude of the k vector is just that free space wave number times refractive index. So it is refractive index just times some constant. Now, if we look at the wave inside that index ellipsoid, here we have another ordinary material, so it's a circular or spherical index ellipsoid. That means our wave vector extends from the origin to a point on the surface, and it has an x component and a y component, and we can also draw the wave. So we just sort of superimpose the wave inside this index ellipsoid. Now let's look at the index ellipsoids for two different materials, material one and material two. And in this case, material one has a lower refractive index. The wave is traveling faster, and so the wave front is more stretched out. Now in the material with the larger refractive index, it has a larger index ellipsoid. However, because the wave is traveling slower, the wave is more compressed and has a shorter wavelength. So don't get confused on this. As the index ellipsoid grows in size, don't think that the wavelength stretches and becomes larger. Actually, as this grows in size, the wavelength becomes smaller. So there's kind of an inverse or backwards relationship here. So we can draw index ellipsoids for different materials. Now here's where this visualization becomes useful. Let's say we're, we have the interface between two different materials. We, we have, we're talking about a wave that's going from material one into material two. So, and here's the interface. In material one, we will draw just half of its index ellipsoid. We only need half. Then in material two, we'll draw its half. And so we can clearly see the interface. So here's our incoming wave vector. We know from boundary conditions that the tangential component of this wave vector has to be continuous across the interface. So we drop a little projection down and we draw that tangential component. For convenience, we just redraw that tangential component over here, and that has to be continuous. So if we drop a projection down where it hits the index ellipsoid on this side, we can describe our refracted ray, and we can see we have refraction. Now, We'll also notice that we have to enforce the electromagnetic boundary conditions, which is really why the tangential component has to be continuous. That ensures that we have continuity. Look at the red lines and the blue lines, that we have continuity in the field. The fact that we require continuity of the field basically tells us we also need continuity of the tangential component of K. Now, I can't do it right here, but if we could imagine testing different directions. So if we could take this bottom circle, rotate it about its center point where I have the cursor. So we'll take this tip and if we could rotate it to the left, suddenly these lines would, would stand much more parallel and there we would see a discontinuity along this line. Likewise, if we rotated it the other way and we got the line standing more vertical, there still would be a discontinuity matching into material one. So there's only one magical angle that makes these compressed wave lines on this side match up to these stretched wave lines on the other side. And so that's called phase matching. And that's the more rigorous way to predict refraction. Let's look at the case where we're going from something with a high refractive index to something with a low refractive index.
So since we have a high refractive index in medium one, we have a larger index ellipsoid. Here's our incoming wave vector. We drop a projection down, so we have our tangential component. For convenience, we move it over here. We drop another projection down, and this point describes the refracted ray. Now, let's come in at a steeper angle. Here's our incoming wave vector. We drop a projection down. This would be the tangential component, but notice that tangential component is larger than the radius of the index ellipsoid on the second side. That means there is no way that we could match to that. Similarly, there's no angle that we could rotate this so that we could match our stretched lines here to the compressed lines up here. That can't happen. So what ends up happening is this incoming wave cannot transmit into the second material. It's cut off and it reflects and we call this total internal reflection. And that's exactly why our, our wave front in material one is so compressed that it's describing a, a spatial periodicity here that's too fast to be matched to it in this medium down here. And so that wave is cut off and it reflects. It cannot transmit. It's cut off. Let's talk more about what happens at an interface with this phase matching picture in mind. So we know what happens to the tangential component of the wave vector. That is continuous across the interface. But what about the longitudinal component, the component of the wave vector that's normal to that interface? How do we find that? Well, it turns out we get that from our dispersion relation. We go back to the dispersion relation. The magnitude of that is set by the materials. The tangential component will know that because of our incoming wave. It's really this longitudinal component that is the unknown. So if we solve this equation for the longitudinal component, we get this equation. So the longitudinal component is the square root of the magnitude of the wave vector set by the material minus the tangential component squared. Now, we have the square root of the difference of two numbers. There's the potential that this could become negative. If it's positive, then the square root of a positive number is a positive number and we get a real number for ky, not a problem. But if this number inside here is negative, the square root of a negative number makes this component become imaginary. And that's what's describing the cutoff condition. When that longitudinal component is imaginary, we have pure decay going away from the interface. It does not push power away from the interface and it totally reflects. It's cut off. So here's some pictures that may help clarify this. This first picture here is going from something with a low refractive index into a high refractive index. The low refractive index, the wave is traveling faster, so the wave is more spread out. Here the wave is traveling slower and it's more compressed. And if we do our phase matching, we can see that the direction of the wave bends a little bit. It refracts at the interface. But right at the interface, there definitely is continuity. And so when we go from low index to high index, there's always some transmission. There's no cutoff angles or critical angles here. Now, if we look at these two cases where we're going from something with a high refractive index to something with a low refractive index, in the high refractive index, the wave is traveling slowly. The wave fronts are compressed. In material two, the wave is traveling faster and the wave fronts are more stretched out. As long as we're coming in at relatively small angles, there's usually an angle over here that we can rotate to match the spatial periodicity along this tangential component to the wave front up here. However, if we come in at a large enough angle, even if we make these humps travel completely parallel to the interface, they're still more stretched out than the spatial periodicity along this interface, and it's cut off. When it's cut off, let's see what this looks like. We have pure decay in the direction away from the interface, but the tangential component, which is real, is continuous across the interface, so even on this side, we get constant amplitude humps moving in the direction of the interface, but pure decay moving away. And so this is called an evanescent field and it's cut off. So interestingly, even though we have total internal reflection, some of the power penetrates and does feel what's happening over here. 
but it doesn't keep going. It's not pushing power away from the interface. And this will total and reflect. We can kind of think of it as a wave coming in, getting trapped into this evanescent field for a bit. It probably travels along the interface and then slowly leaks out. So what happens on reflections may be a little bit more complicated than we might have thought. So here's a movie that I'm going to play. And we are, we are simulating now uh, reflection and transmission from an interface for both the, the TE polarization and the TM polarization. On the left is the picture of the field. And on the right, we're coming in at an increasing angle of incidence and we're looking at transmission and reflection for an increasing angle of incidence. Let's see what happens. There's a lot here, so I'll probably play it multiple times. Notice both polarizations have a cutoff at the same frequency. The below that, at shallower angles, the reflection and transmission is different, but we expected that from the Fresnel equations. And above that critical angle, we get 100% reflection, 0% transmission. Now this horizontal black line, that's the interface. On this simulation, watch what the field does on the transmitted side. Notice right near that cutoff, we get very large evanescent fields. So near the cutoff, that field does actually penetrate. It's not propagating away but it does penetrate. So that's a key concept. So to sort of foreshadow what we're gonna talk about next lecture, we see a configuration here that has large evanescent fields. If they touched our PMLs, bad things would happen. Now we're going from something with a low refractive index to high refractive index. There should not be a critical angle. And in fact, there's not. But one interesting thing does happen. We see that for the TM polarization, reflection goes to exactly zero here. That's actually called the Brewster's angle. But for this case, I'll play it one more time. We always get some transmission, some reflection. We get refraction. And that minimum in reflection for the TM polarization is called the Brewster's angle. In this case, it's about 60 degrees. So because on paper we can't freeze or play those movies, here's some freeze frames of this. And we're looking at the critical angle now. So it was the first case where we're going from something with high refractive index to something with low refractive index. And it has a critical angle at exactly 45 degrees. I chose the material properties to make that exact. So in the top, we see a bunch of bright spots, dark spots. What's happening here is we have an incoming wave and a reflected wave. And we're looking at the interference between those two waves. Then in material two, we simply see a refracted wave. But very near the critical angle, we're only one degree away, the transmitted wave is traveling very, very parallel to the interface. And it gets even more parallel as we approach 45 degrees. Immediately on the other side of 45 degrees, we see that our field penetrates. Our interface is right here, and our field penetrates really, really far. And, you know, we could say it penetrates about a wavelength. As we move away from the critical angle, penetration gets a lot less. And here we're coming in almost at 90 degrees. We're talking about a wave that's coming in at a really, really, really large angle. And it hardly penetrates at all. Now we're changing subjects briefly. We're going to talk about waves and periodic materials. And then at the very end, we'll bring all of this together. Now by a periodic structure, there's different ways we can talk about things being periodic. Certainly at the atomic scale, many materials are periodic. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about much more large scale periodicity where the actual physical structure the wave is propagating through is periodic on the order of the wavelength. So for microwaves, we could literally hold these things in our hands and stick our fingers through the holes and stuff like that. So it's a much larger scale periodicity than the atomic scale.
So when I talk about waves and periodic structures, that's what I'm talking about. Now, why, why are we doing this to our code? Why are we using periodic boundary conditions on the left and right? Why do we care about all this? Because a lot of really cool stuff happens when our materials are periodic, and we need to set up models to be able to handle this. Folks are working on waveguides where the cladding of the waveguide, in other words, the stuff on the outside that's supposed to be trapping the energy, uh, produces what are called band gaps that acts like a mirror, and these are periodic. We can trap light at a single point by embedding it in periodic materials. We can make optical fibers have periodic structures in there and do some really cool things. Uh, not too long ago, they recently demonstrated a periodic structure which had a negative refractive index. Negative refractive index materials also have negative thickness and they reverse Doppler shift and other really cool stuff happens. We can make antennas periodic, phased array antennas. So we can steer these electronically, not mechanically. This doesn't have to move, yet we can steer a beam radiating away from this. We can slow waves down. We can take a wave and slow it down so much that you could literally walk faster than the wave is traveling. Frequency selective surfaces, one of the things that make the, the stealth fighter, the stealth bomber stealthy, they have special metallic structures in their skin that absorb enemy radar so that it doesn't reflect back and they can't see the airplane. So lots of things are periodic and there's many more than I'm even discussing here. My point is periodic structures are very interesting and we need to set up our model to be able to analyze these things. So let's start at the beginning. Let's say we have a wave. So we have, we're looking at our wave fronts here. It's traveling in the direction of the wave vector, so the wave's propagating from top down, and it encounters some kind of dielectric object. Well, we know that the wave slows down inside this dielectric object, so by the time it passes through it, this part of the wave front is delayed. It's retarded compared to the wave front on the outside. And notice that we've, we've sort of bent the wave front in a shape somewhat similar to the object that it passed through. So now what happens if we have a periodic array of these objects and we have that same wave front that propagates through? Each one of these objects perturbs the wave front. The interesting thing and the very useful thing is that the wave front takes on the same periodicity as the structure that it passed through. Now, if these objects were shaped like hearts, that does not mean our electric field will be shaped like hearts. It just takes on the same periodicity. So we look at the spacing between these objects, and the field becomes periodic with that same spacing. That's all that means. So the big conclusion here, waves and periodic structures take on the same periodicity as the stuff that they're in, their host. So periodic structures then chop up a wave front. It makes the wave front periodic. Periodic functions we can decompose into a Fourier series. So suddenly our wave front is expressed as a summation of discrete things. And it turns out those discrete things are discrete plane waves traveling at different angles. And in fact, if we had a periodic structure, we shined a laser pointer through it, we would see a discrete set of dots on the wall. So this is not a continuum of angles. These are actually discrete angles because the, the terms in the Fourier series are discrete. It turns out the directions of those diffracted modes can be calculated using the famous grading equation. So we have some kind of incoming wave with an angle of incidence theta ints and the refractive index out here, I'll call n incident. So in the grading equation, we have a sine theta ints and an n ints term. And that's really describing the source wave. Then it's, something is periodic here. We don't know what, but something has forced the wave front to be periodic. Our waves can reflect off of that or they can transmit through it. In either case, just the fact that we've forced our field to be periodic, it reflects into discrete diffraction orders and it also transmits into discrete diffraction orders. And we can calculate these directions without having to go back to Maxwell's equations. So the refractive index up here is also the refractive index of the reflection region. So that's really the same as n ints. 
So I'll write n in the refraction region, sine theta m. So this is the sine of the angle of the diffracted order, of order m. And we can see these. So this is the zero order diffracted mode, the minus one order reflected mode, plus one, plus two, plus three, so on. And on the transmitted side, we have a similar thing. We have our zero order mode, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, minus one, minus two. And depending on the period, there is more or less of these diffracted modes. And the equation for the transmitted side is exactly this equation, just with one change. Here, we're looking in the transmission region with a different refractive index, so we just change out this n trans. So this is the refractive index in the transmission region. Sine theta m, that's the sine of these angles. And then we also have this term. m is the diffraction order. It's an integer and it goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. And so we get many, many discrete angles, but they are discrete. This is not a continuum of angles. Diffraction gives you discrete angles. Now, the grading equation tells us the directions of those. If we want to know how much power from that applied wave goes into each of those modes, then we have to go back to Maxwell's equations. We have to run a finite difference time domain simulation to figure that out. So let's animate grading diffraction so we can get a feel of what happens. When the grading period is very, very short, it turns out, we call this a zero order grading, it doesn't diffract at all. We only see those zero order modes. As we stretch, and what you'll see in this movie, we're slowly stretching that grading period longer and longer and longer. At some point, suddenly diffracted modes appear. And as we stretch it, more and more diffracted modes appear. So let's go ahead and run that. We're stretching the grating. Notice that diffraction orders appear first inside that grating. That's because it has a higher average refractive index. But at some point, they also start appearing in the reflection region as well. So let's play that one more time. Notice they start traveling very parallel to the interface, the diffraction orders. And as we stretch, they walk downward, kind of working toward that zero order mode. But when they first pop into existence, they're very, very parallel to that interface. Let's look at the same simulation now, but now our applied wave, rather than have normal incidence, is coming in at some angle. The same thing happens, it's just that the diffraction orders aren't symmetric anymore. And the reason that symmetry is destroyed is because we're coming in at an angle. So things look a little bit different than last time. Let's play this one more time. The numbers that I'm showing, A is the period of the grading, and lambda is the wavelength of the wave. And so we're looking at that ratio, so we're really looking at the period of the grading relative to the wavelength. The longer that period is relative to the wavelength, the more diffraction orders there are. So because we can't play movies on paper, here's a summary of what we saw. When the grading period is very, very short, we just see our zero order modes, the zero order transmitted and zero order reflected. As we stretch this grading, at some point we start to see diffraction orders in the transmission region. We see these first because the refractive index is higher down here. If for some reason it was higher up here, we would see diffraction orders in this reflection region first. When they first pop into existence, they're pointing, talking about a wave traveling very parallel to the interface, but as we continue to stretch, they walk downward, and then more and more diffraction orders appear. And then at some point, the period's long enough that we're starting to see diffraction orders in the reflection region. Again, when they pop into existence, they're traveling very parallel to the interface, as we stretch the period even more and more, they walk upward toward the zero order mode. And for really, really long gradings, we have many, many, many diffraction orders. And when this period is, let's say, 100 times longer than the wavelength, it really, at that point, does start to look like a continuum of angles. So it's only when the period of that is on the order of a wavelength, or maybe 10 or 20 times that, that we can actually see these discrete modes. When it gets very, very large, it does tend to look like a continuum.
Okay, so now we're going to tie all this stuff together and talk about the plane wave spectrum. Remember the one-dimensional complex Fourier series. If we have a function, f of x, that is periodic with some period capital lambda, so maybe it looks like this, we can write it as a complex Fourier series. And essentially we have a bunch of these complex exponentials that we weight with these coefficients. And we calculate our coefficients according to this integral. And so instead of writing a function as a bunch of square waves, we can write it as a summation of a bunch of these complex exponentials. Now, in a computer, we can't retain an infinite number of terms. We usually truncate this. So let's think what happens now. We have a wave. It travels through something periodic. That forces the field to become periodic. And we can look at that function in this little cross section. So our field is periodic, and it has some period lambda sub x. And that's the same period as the spacing between these objects. So it turns out fields in periodic structures obey something called Bloch's equation. And the total electric field takes on this type of symmetry. And it has an amplitude term and then a plane wave phase sort of tilt term. It's a little bit wrong to say that the electric field takes on the same periodicity as its host. A little bit incorrect. It's actually this amplitude envelope that takes on exactly that same periodicity. There's also this plane wave phase tilt term which does not have that same symmetry as the host that it's in. It just looks like a plane wave. So for that reason, because this is here, the, the overall total electric field doesn't necessarily take on the same periodicity. It's just this amplitude envelope. Now this amplitude envelope is periodic. So we can decompose it into a Fourier series. So we'll expand this into a Fourier series. First we'll take this complex exponential, this plane wave phase term, if you will, move it to the left. So we have that to the left and then we expand our periodic amplitude function into a complex Fourier series. And here's the, the amplitude term of that that's multiplying these complex exponentials. And we can calculate it from this amplitude function if we somehow know it. Now we're going to do some math, just some rearranging of terms. So we have our electric field here. And we have our plane wave phase term. And then that amplitude term that we expanded into a complex Fourier series. Now this beta is a vector. It has an x and y component. And we'll separate it into its x and y components and bring that exponential in and combine it with this exponential that's inside the complex Fourier series. I want to define this term, a case of x, which will be a function of m. It'll be the x component of beta minus 2 pi m over lambda x. And here's that 2 pi m over lambda x. So when we bring this exponential inside, it turns out using this substitution of variables, we can write our total electric field this way. So we have a summation of amplitudes times something, some stuff, this kx term here times x plus e to the j beta y. Nothing happened to the y component because this had an x in here. So it only played with the x component of beta. The y term pulls off here. So now we can pull these two exponentials together and it really takes on this form. We have the summation of our amplitude term, which changes depending on this uh, integer m, because they can each have a different weight in our complex Fourier series. But when we pull these together, we can write this as a k vector, which changes with m dot r, k dot r. This is the form of a plane wave with some amplitude. So in other words, if we have a periodic electric field, this really is the same as if we had a bunch of plane waves traveling at different angles. And in that area of space where they all overlap, it reconstructs this original periodic function. And so anytime the electric field is periodic, we can decompose it into a bunch of plane waves traveling at different angles. That set of plane waves is our plane wave spectrum. Simple as that. So anytime we have a field that's periodic, we can decompose it into a bunch of plane waves at a bunch of different angles. And in that area of space where they all overlap, it would reconstruct that original 
periodic electric field. And so we can decompose our electric field into a plane wave spectrum. Let's think about the wave vector components of our plane wave spectrum. So we have some periodic structure, some applied wave coming in at, at the angle theta ints. So in terms of the applied wave, we can write it this way. It has an x and y component of the wave vectors, and we can write it in terms of the angle of incidence and the refractive index up here. And so we can write an equation for our applied wave. So when we enter a grating and it chops up the wave front, this equation on the previous slide, what essentially says is we start off with an x component and we add to it or subtract from it an infinite number of multiples of 2 pi over the period. So essentially we get a whole series of different transverse wave vectors that can now exist simply because that periodic structure chopped up the wave front. Our incoming wave originally had this, but this grating chops it up and now we have an infinite number or an infinite series of transverse wave vector components. Just possibilities. That does not mean that any power will go into those. That just means there's the possibility for them to exist. I also note this original kx ints is a purely real quantity. And that integer m, that's the diffraction order, that goes from minus infinity all the way up to positive infinity. So we have a nice closed form expression now for the transverse component. What about the longitudinal component? Well, remember that comes from the dispersion relation. So we solve this for the longitudinal component and we get the square root of the magnitude of the vector in whatever region we're interested in seeing minus the transverse component squared. And again, we have two possibilities. If what's inside that square root is a positive quantity, KY is real, and we really are talking about a plane wave. If it's negative, it's imaginary, and we're talking about something that would purely decay in the Y direction and would not oscillate and would not push power. Let's visualize what happens now when a wave enters something that's periodic. So we have an incoming wave, k ints, and in this case it's normal incidence, so the, the, the x component of that is zero. But because it's entering something periodic, it chops up the wave front, we really get this infinite series of possible transverse components of the wave vector. That's the consequence of the grading. And so these go off to infinity and they get larger and larger and larger as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Each one of these has to be phase matched into whatever region we're interested in looking at these. In this case, maybe it's inside the grating. So we have the index ellipsoid, in this case it might be air, and then we have to draw the index ellipsoid inside this material. So it's the same index ellipsoid. However, for each one of these index ellipsoids, we are matching a different transverse component of the k vector into it. So remember the larger this k vector, the shorter the period this is describing, the faster the spatial variance is describing. At some point, the spatial variance is too quick to match or be supported in this second material and the wave is cut off. And what we see are these little evanescent fields, like we saw before, confined to the surface and they're not pushing power away from the interface. Well, these lower order few k vectors are small enough that the longitudinal component is a purely real number and we get plane wave propagation. And so really our plane wave spectrum, it's only the few lowest order modes that are actually plane waves. The rest, and sometimes we need to retain a lot of those, are evanescent waves. So maybe we should call it the evanescent wave spectrum, but it's not, it's called the plane wave spectrum. But that's a pretty good way to visualize what happens when we phase match into a periodic structure. So in conclusion, here are the key concepts to come away from this lecture. Fields in periodic media take on the same periodicity as their host. So in other words, whatever period the device is the wave is traveling through, it takes on that same period. So the field becomes periodic. Well, if the field is periodic, we can decompose it into a Fourier series. So suddenly the, the field, 
which is periodic, is a written as a discrete sum of things. And it turns out those things have the form of plane waves, which we call the plane wave spectrum. But they're discrete plane waves. It's not a continuum of plane waves. And it turns out there's really an infinite number of them. Only the lowest few order of those are actually plane waves. The rest, that transverse wave vector component is so large, it's talking about a field that's varying too abruptly to be supported in the material that we're talking about, and they're cut off at the surface. So that's the conclusion from this lecture. We will pick up on this next time and discuss how we're going to calculate power flowing out of a periodic structure.